Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Brenda Haug and I'm the facilitator for today's session which will feature Sam Becker talking about the impact survey. Thanks everyone for being here. Before we dive into the content, I'll talk about ReadyTalk, the technology we're using for today's session. You should be hearing audio right now through your computer speakers or through your headphones. And if that's not working for some reason, if it's choppy, or for whatever reason, you also can use the phone for audio. And we'll put the phone number into chat for you. So again, we're, I'm just going to double check and make sure that everyone can hear us now. And let us know in chat, and we'll help troubleshoot if, if you're having any audio issues or other tech, technical issues. We'll use chat throughout the session. Feel free to use it to um, people are sharing right now where they're at and what the weather is like. You can also ask questions, share your experiences. If you have web resources that are relevant, feel free to share those there. So again, use chat throughout the session. The number one question we always get asked at this point is, will this be recorded? And the answer is, yes it will. Later today you'll get a follow-up email message. And in that it will have a link to the session recording. You'll also get a copy of these PowerPoint slides that we're using. And then any websites that are discussed or shared during the session. I know Sam has a number of websites she's going to mention, and we'll include those. And well, any that are shared in the chat too, we'll share those. Today's webinar is being brought to you by several groups. I work with TechSoup for Libraries, which is part of TechSoup, an organization that helps nonprofits and libraries use technology to serve their communities. And TechSoup is one of the organizations that is part of a coalition called the EDGE Initiative. And during her presentation, Sam is going to be talking about the connection between the EDGE Initiative and the Impact Survey. So we'll go ahead and start with Sam and hear about the Impact Survey from her. So welcome, Sam. Thank you, Brenda. I'm really, really happy to be here and, um, and so glad to see so many uh, new names on the um, participant list. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you um, today about Impact Survey. Um, and, but before we get started, I wanted to do a poll and just ask you how long it's been since you surveyed your community about their technology use. So there's a poll uh, up on the screen right now, and if you could answer that, that will help me um, uh, understand more um, about what, what, uh, where you're coming from. Uh, so the impact survey was, um, was developed um, uh, about 2009 when we were doing the Opportunity for All study. And what we wanted to do was provide a way for uh, libraries to participate in our research about public access technology and also to supplement a national phone survey um, that we knew would miss a lot of important users of library technology. And so as we were figuring out how to get libraries to participate, we came up with this uh, way of having them uh, post links to our survey through their library websites. And in return for their help, we were able to give um, back to the library community um, uh, reports about the use in their particular library. So over the past several years, we've been uh, working to develop the impact survey into a tool that libraries can use on their own um, to gather information about how patrons use their uh, technology services, um, particularly about uh, about what kinds of outcomes they're experiencing as a result of the resources and services that you provide. Um, we wanted to create a, uh, a way for libraries to get information that they can use to figure out what kinds of resources and services they need to provide to patrons to support them in the kinds of tasks that um, they're more likely to do in, in your particular community. And then we wanted to make it really easy for libraries to present the findings from this survey to key stakeholders so that you can have information uh, about, uh, about your users to take to the Rotary Club or to the city manager. Sam, can we share those poll results with everyone? Sure. Okay. So there you can get a, a sense of where participants are at, where how long it's been since people have done a survey like this. 
Well, I'm glad to see that, uh, that many, many of you, it looks like uh, um, about 60% of you have actually done some sort of community technology um, survey, which is super. Um, we really hope that um, the burden that, uh, that is created by trying to do surveys will be lessened by impact survey, and then you'll be able to do it uh, more often, maybe once a year or, or every other year. So, um, for impact survey, there's a few really big benefits that we are trying to create for libraries. We're trying to save you the time and energy that it takes to develop um, uh, survey questions on your own. So a lot of you are coming up with um, different kinds of survey instruments for different purposes. And it's hard to figure out what to ask, and it's also hard to know uh, whether or not um, the survey questions that you are asking are actually valid. In other words, do the respondents understand what the question means and are asking it in the way you intended? So we developed the, the survey instrument itself. We have tested it. It works really well. People understand it. And so it saves you that process of having to develop those survey questions. We also wanted to save you the, the time and expense of programming your own web survey. So a lot of you use SurveyMonkey for different kinds of patron surveys. Um, we've set it up so that you don't have to do any of it. As soon as you uh, sign up to use it, you're, you're able to access it, and there's no programming um, that you have to do. And then finally, we, we, we realize that the, the biggest barrier to surveying really is having the staff to take the survey results and do something with them. So we wanted to create a way for for libraries to get the results in a format that they can use and not have to spend staff time um, creating pie charts and presentations and that kind of thing. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the survey asks questions about activities in core outcome areas. Um, these are outcome areas that our research showed were important both for um, patrons being able to complete important tasks that lead to kind of better self-sufficiency as well as what policymakers want to hear about in terms of how um, patrons are using library technology. Um, we also have questions in the survey about library use, uh, regular library use and visits, and also um, questions about how the patron uses your library website. So you'll be getting um, some information about that as well um, in your report. So I just wanted to walk through really quickly um, how you get set up, just to show you it's very easy and give you some information about how it works um, and the best way to optimize your response rates. And, and we have some tips on the website about that also. So the basic steps are that you create an account. You install this link on your website. Uh, you allow the survey to run in your community for uh, two or four weeks. And then the very next day you are able to go back to your account and get the results in, um, in these customized reports. So it, in the registration, uh, if you go to our website, you will see a button that says Register Today. Um, in the registration process, um, you'll be asked to supply an email address um, for your library system. It makes it a lot easier for us if you use your official library uh, email. That way we can confirm you mo uh, more quickly. Um, when you're setting up, uh, you'll see a drop-down menu uh, with, with states. If you choose your state, then the library systems will appear in the next uh, menu below. And if you don't find your library on the list, you, please contact us. Um, we may be able to add you. Um, we've also had a lot of libraries that um, want to share the survey. Um, they may be uh, some sort of a cooperative where there's uh, library systems that officially according to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, are separate systems, but they operate um, completely together. So we have some ways of dealing with that, but it has to be kind of on a one-on-one uh, one, one -on -one, um, basis. Sam, is it just public libraries that can use the survey? What about schools or academic? 
Uh, right now it's just U.S. public libraries. Um, we just added this morning the ability to make it available for military libraries as well. Um, we are in the process of figuring out how to um, add uh, libraries from outside of the U.S. Um, and also um, we're looking to get some information from the schools and the, particularly the community college libraries that we've talked to um, about how the survey would work for them. So some of the questions in the survey may not be applicable to them, um, and we would need to do some retooling around, uh, around the survey um, and, and develop the technology to deliver that to them. So that's, a, that's our plan in the, in the next probably year, uh, longer term, to, to make uh, it available to school libraries. But uh, in the shorter term, we will be adding the capability of, uh, of libraries outside the U.S. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, if we also have the ability, if you refer to your library by a name other than what is official uh, with the IMLS, you can change that here. Um, also, if, you, if your library is one that frequently uses an acronym for your library, maybe sometimes even more frequently than the full name, you can um, add that here as well. And those are the names that will appear in the reports that you get. Um, we're really, really excited uh, to announce a new um, feature on the website, um, which is the ability for you to designate a website for your patrons to be redirected to um, when they're done with the survey. So right now it just goes to a generic, or previously it just went to a generic thank you page. Now you can use your library web page and redirect them there, or for libraries that want to offer some sort of an incentive for participation, you can redirect them to a site where they can uh, leave their email address for a drawing or something like that. And I'll talk about that more um, when I address promoting the survey to get good results. You want to take a couple more questions? We're getting, sure. getting a bunch. Okay. One question is, the survey is available for free for the first year. Any indication of what the pricing model will look like after that? Yes, yeah, so it's free until next October. Um, and after that, um, we're, we're going to mostly try to get uh, state libraries to um, uh, purchase a license for their entire state. Um, but for individual libraries, um, we expect, first of all, it will be on a sliding scale um, depending on the library's budget size. Uh, and population. Um, and we anticipate that the cost will be um, somewhere in the neighborhood of between $50 and $500 depending on the library size. So um, we think that that's a really good uh, price point. Um, we're able to keep our costs low by automating a lot of um, the report generation. And uh, as more libraries use the system, um, we'll be able to continue to um, lower the price. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, um, so then we ask you about your library, um, some basic information about your library data. We've pulled in data from the IMLS that you uh, provided probably a couple of years ago. So we give you an, uh, an opportunity to update those values. It's mostly about your population and your funding. Um, these, uh, these data will, will appear in some of the reports to contextualize the findings, so it's good um, if you can provide the most updated value um, for those. Um, we also give you the opportunity to update your location. So if you're a library with multiple locations, um, you're provided with a list of those locations which you can uh, change, uh, close, or add um, locations as well. And that, uh, those those locations end up being uh, used to populate a branch selection map um, that will appear for your patrons when they click on the survey link from your library website. So this allows us to be able to provide to you a data set that shows um, which survey responses came from which library and also um, which comments came from which library branch. 
Um, we also have an, an intake questionnaire. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit of, um, of information for the reports and a little bit of information for us. So we're constantly um, making improvements to the system as we get feedback from libraries. Um, we want to understand what libraries are doing and, and, and what they need, and we also want to look at um, the relationship between the things that you offer um, and the kinds of outcomes that your patrons are experiencing. And that helps us um, contextualize the impact survey on a national level and do advocacy um, there as well. So we appreciate you filling out this form. It, everything on the form you should be able to answer off the top of your head, so hopefully it won't take more than um, a few minutes. Um, when you're all done with that, um, you can uh, begin to get ready for the survey by selecting dates that you want to um, field the survey in your library. Um, we recommend you run the survey for around two to three weeks for kind of an average size community around 150,000 or better. Smaller libraries in small communities uh, need to run the survey uh, longer in order to get a good response rate. So we recommend for the small libraries that they start out at, uh, at four weeks. And if they're still not uh, satisfied with, um, with their results, we, we can extend um, up to six weeks for them. What do you consider a good response rate? Is it a percentage of community size, or how would you determine what, what a good response rate is? No, you know, the, the survey itself is not representative, right? It's always going to be a convenient sample. So we really want to get you uh, enough responses so that when we're calculating the percentages that they're meaningful. And the, the, the size of the response rate is really dependent on uh, how many people in the community and how many people in the community um, use the library. So, we like to see for little libraries uh, response rates in the 40 to 50 range, and I'm talking about very small libraries. For larger libraries, we usually see um, response rates um, at 2,000 surveys or, or better. So um, you know, we don't like to see surveys that have fewer than 10 responses. Uh, and we encourage libraries to, um, to do some additional work to promote the survey when that happens. Okay, good. That helps. All right. So the, the, on the fielding dates, when you select your fielding dates, you're also given the option to use a paper survey um, version of, uh, of the public access survey. So um, in some libraries and in some communities, your patrons may feel more comfortable filling out a paper survey. Um, they may prefer to do it uh, rather than use uh, their computer time. Um, we don't get a terribly good response rate on the paper surveys. Um, it, uh, it, it, the, the survey itself looks a little intimidating on paper. Uh, when it's online, there's a lot of skip logic um, that, that shortens the time the patron is using the survey. So um, if, if you want to use that, you can. Um, once you click the paper survey button, um, we provide you with a PDF of the survey that you can print out and leave uh, at your library. Um, when the survey is closed, when your fielding date has passed, you'll have seven days um, to enter those surveys into our system. And so our system. I, I see. I hear an echo. Um, uh, anyway, we have a special portal for you to enter in those paper surveys, so it will go much quicker than if you went through the the patron side of the of the um, of the survey entry. Uh, so just something that's a feature for some libraries may want to use; others um, may want to skip over this. Okay, so a couple questions coming in about what the things we just covered. So one was back to the what's a good response rate, and you said for a little library, 40 to 50 range. So getting 40 to 50 surveys filled out in a small, for a small library, that's what you consider a good response rate? For a small library, that, that they're doing pretty well, and I'm talking about okay. under 10,000. Yes. Um, and, and 
you know, the, the thing to keep in mind is that this is real data. These are real people who are doing things on your library computer. So even though it's not representative, it's still good information on what folks are doing. Okay. And then for the larger lab library, the 2,000 number, that would be 2,000 surveys filled out would be a good number for a, a larger community. Yes. Okay. So Got somewhere in, in, you know, in between. We'd like to see you know, for, for kind of average size libraries, two or, two or 300, and that's usually pretty attainable. Gretchen may be able to talk to that. Okay. Uh, Gretchen Pruitt may be able to talk to that when she and then joins us. Another question was about the paper survey. So if a library chose the paper survey, or do you recommend that they all choose to have that as an option? So people can either fill it out online or also have some paper surveys available. Um, yeah, so it's totally up to you. Um, we, we, we're, we're pretty agnostic about this. It's a way of, uh, of reaching out to certain types of people. Uh, in previous versions we found that um, older folks and uh, very, very low income people are slightly more likely to use the paper survey, but it's not huge. So um, it's really up to you. And I would say that the deciding factor is whether or not you have the personnel or volunteers who can enter those paper survey responses into our system. All right, moving on. Um, so when, when you're ready to start the survey, when your fielding dates come up, um, you'll go and get your links. Um, and this is a, these are custom links that are embedded with a URL that takes the patron to the survey. And that link uh, has code in it that records for us which library it came from. So it's really important that you use um, the links that we provide. Uh, the URL that we provide. And we have several different options for linking to the survey. Um, we recommend that you use more than one of these approaches. So um, our favorite approach is this light box. Um, we provide you with just a tiny little bit of code, just this little snippet of code, and that goes into the head um, of your library's website and creates that light box. Um, once the, if, if the patron doesn't follow that link um, or closes that light box, then it won't appear again for that patron um, uh, uh, when they go back to the library website. So we know that patrons go back and forth from the library's home page. We didn't want that to pop up. So it's important to also have a button or a banner on your website um, so that if they close out that button, they can still get to, um, to the survey. And so for buttons and banners, we have a variety of different sizes and orientations that will hopefully, uh, one of those will hopefully fit into a spot on your website. Um, if you have some sort of a, a news banner or something, um, you can just insert those here. Um, you can also, um, uh, the code, um, uh, is here we host the button so you don't have to download anything. You just need to uh, insert this, this little snippet of code where you want um, the button to appear on your library website. And this can be used with your content management system. So if you're using um, uh, Drupal or WordPress or a site like that, um, you can use this uh, uh, also. So you can put this on Facebook too. You could be promoting your – you could take some of that and put a, a message on Facebook about the survey on your library's Facebook page. Yes, yes, you yes. can. That's, okay. that's definitely a great approach. Um, if you want, you can also make your own button for the survey. So we provide you with the actual kind of uh, core uh, link there on, on the button page. And so if you have a particular style or you don't like the buttons that we're providing, um, you can certainly make an image of your own. And all you'll need to do is, um, is add to that um, uh, the, direct, uh, uh, the direction to your folder where that image is. And if you have questions about that, we can certainly help you and walk you through that. Great. Thank you. Um, 
once you've done that, uh, or, or about three weeks before you launch the survey, you should really start planning for how you're going to, um, to make the survey uh, available in your library and how you're going to um, promote it with your patrons and the rest of the community. So we have a timeline there with some hints uh, and tips about how to increase your response rate. Um, we also have some uh, um, uh, pre-formatted um, documents that you can use. So we have like a table tent you can put up next to the computers. We have signs that are populated with your URL that you can hang around the computer. Um, we have sample emails that you can send to your uh, library list. Um, and just, I, I know that this is a concern of a lot of libraries, and some libraries that previously used Impact Survey weren't um, satisfied with their response rate. So um, we have, uh, uh, it, it's really kind of your part of it to really promote it. Um, one of the things that you can do is offer a prize or an incentive to patrons who complete the survey. And again, by using that redirect link that I talked about earlier, you can send them to a Google form um, or something like that to leave their email address for a drawing. Um, and that is a pretty good incentive that some libraries have used. Other libraries have been really successful by extending computer session times during the survey period. Some, uh, uh, some of your session management software may uh, allow you to extend it only for people that click through the survey. Not all of them are capable of doing that. Um, but that does tend to increase the number of completed surveys. Um, also, if you have a very, very busy um, computer lab, you may want to set up just a, a terminal that does nothing but go to the survey so that people, if they're waiting for a computer to free up or they're done with their session, can go um, and fill out the survey um, using that terminal. Uh, definitely need to place a lot of signage around the libraries, uh, especially where pa patrons are using the Wi-Fi so that they know the survey is, is going on. Um, if you have a, some sort of a login screen for your Wi-Fi, um, you might uh, want to put a link to the survey there so that patrons can see it in case they bypass the library's website. Um, we also recommend that you send an email to your patron list that includes the link. Uh, and a lot of libraries have been very successful getting notices in the local paper or making radio announcements. Um, and that just drives people to the website where they can click on the link um, and, uh, and take the survey. Um, we have found uh, in our research that library patrons are kind of unusually willing to take surveys. Um, and, uh, and, and generally speaking, on average over the past two times we've, we um, piloted this project, we've had a 25 to 30 percent completion rate. So patrons who begin the survey, about 25 to 30 percent actually complete it, which is um, actually quite high for a web survey. Should we pause here for questions? Sure. Let's take a couple of questions. So something we've been asked is some people would like to just see a sample survey. Is there a website or something they can go to where they can see a live survey or see what a sample survey without actually signing up and going through and putting in their own information? Um, that's a really good idea actually. No, we don't have that. We do have test accounts. So if you have a library organization that just wants to um, poke around and see how it works before they decide to use it, they can do that. Um, you can also view the survey questions, but, um, but that's a great idea to have actually a, like a test library site where people can see how it works. So I'll, yeah, I'll bring that up to my crew and see if okay. we can do that. Um, how long does it take people to take the survey and at just a rough average? Um, the, the median time is about six minutes. Uh, some people, if they're using the computers for a lot of things, if their whole life is there at the library on the public access, it will take them probably about 10 minutes. Um, but for most people, they fall into the four to six minute range. Okay. And is it worded in a way where it's primarily geared towards adults, or would it be something that children could take also? Um, right now uh, it's designed for, um, for 
people over the age of 14. So we, are, uh, we don't allow people under 14 to take the survey, um, but it is certainly appropriate for, um, for teens and, and young adults. Um, particularly we ask questions about how, um, how patrons use the, uh, use the library's computers for educational purposes, so it's good to get um, those teens and, and, uh, and, pre and, and uh, young adults answering that. Okay. And this one I'll ask you, but then also maybe others who are on the call who have done surveys like this can share too. But have most libraries, has it been kind of a passive approach to getting responses or have, they had, have you had libraries where staff actually approaches people and asks for people to, you know, directly ask people to fill out the survey? Um, We've had libraries do both. So um, uh, most of them kind of have a more passive approach to it, although you know, the, the light box is kind of um, a, a, a more in-your-face advertisement for it. But in very small libraries where you, know, you might only get four or five people a day coming in, we've definitely had um, librarians personally ask people to take the survey. Okay, great. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, during the survey, you can go to your My Impact um, dashboard, and you can keep track of how many surveys have been submitted. So it will show up there. It gets, um, gets updated. Um, if you're not satisfied with your response rate as you're getting close to the end of your fielding period, um, if you haven't reached that four-week maximum, you can extend it by returning to the Fielding Dates tab. Um, if you're at four weeks and you still want to extend it, you'll just need to shoot us an email. And we'll will uh, unlock that for you. But we want to check in with folks that are going that long to make sure that we're um, engaging in activities to maximize the response rate. So once that's all done and your fielding date has closed and you've confirmed that you entered all the paper surveys that you collected, the very next day you can come back to the site um, and download uh, reports that contain um, the, the results of your survey. So we have several different reports available, a comprehensive report that shows all of um, the survey responses. And it's nice. It's graphic. Um, it's got tables. It's also got text um, that talks about what the survey results are. Um, it's a pretty long report, so maybe something that is more useful um, uh, internally. Um, but we also have other reports that are designed for you to share with external stakeholders like your city manager um, or your chamber of commerce. Uh, we also have now the ability for you to actually download the data set from your survey responses. So if there are things um, that you want to look at um, that aren't included in any of the reports that we've created, you can do that on your own using Excel with pivot tables or, or, um, or something like that. Uh, this comes in handy if you have particular questions, for example, about how certain, uh, certain types of people, demographic uh, categories of people use the library computers versus others, um, that kind of information. We do have some of those uh, cross-tabulations, but um, there are certainly more demographics that could be done against that. So that's a nice um, additional feature for you. So that was actually one of the questions we were asked. So information, that's not a question people respond to, but information that tells you, for example, was this survey completed on a library computer or from outside of the library, um, IP addresses or browser types, that kind of thing. Is that information available to the library? Um, w you will get information uh, in the data set about uh, how the, how the um, patron access the survey, so at home, um, uh, in the library, um, uh, or in the paper survey. Um, we won't uh, be passing on any information about IP addresses um, or browser information. The, the survey itself does not collect um, that kind of information, okay. so we don't actually have it to, to give back. Um, you could certainly, uh, if you're running the survey, you can certainly install um, a Google Analytic on your website to see where traffic is coming uh, that subsequently clicks on the, the survey button. Okay. And then one more question, um, people wondering about mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, and how well this survey displays on those, those devices. Um, the survey will um, display on a tablet or smartphone. It's not 
um, designed uh, specially for that, um, but it's a pretty simple interface. So it will show up just fine on those devices. Um, and uh, of course, if your website is optimized uh, for that, then the button will also show up there. Uh, I also want to point out that the survey itself is also uh, meets accessibility requirements, so people who are using uh, assistive devices can also take the survey. Great, thank you. All right. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm really really pleased to um, to have here with us uh, Gretchen Pruitt. Um, she's uh, the library director at the New Braunfels uh, Texas Public Library. Uh, and New Braunfels used um, the Impact Survey in 2011, and they just recently um, finished up um, their survey. And they also happen to be an Edge pilot library, so they've used the results um, in their uh, Impact Survey um, for some of the activities related to Edge. So, Gretchen, hi. Hi, Samantha. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being um, here. I'm ho I was hoping you could just kind of share your experience about how you used Impact Survey and um, and the benefits that you found from using it. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I can very much attest to the fact that you finish it and 24 hours later your reports are up because we just finished our second round on – well, we said the 1st of December, but realistically we finished it yesterday. And so I just pulled down the um, – the results today. So I, I have only briefly glimpsed, glimpsed at them, and I'm, and I'm going to want to compare them to the prior year. But, but really, truly, 24 hours later, we have, we have our report. So that was pretty wonderful. Um, the, the impact survey in 2011 that we did coincided with our invitation to be an EDGE pilot library. And they really came through about the same time. But of the two, the impact survey was initially the one that I was more excited about because like a lot of library directors out there, you get a lot of people coming in and saying, you know, what what are people doing in the library? We don't know. You know, we did we did not we don't have software on our public networks that tell us where what websites people are going to and our IT department does not did not I will say I will use past tense there. Our IT department did not consider our public access computer technology to be a high priority for them. So they didn't put a lot of resources into it. They didn't really uh, they just locked it down as much as they felt they needed to do, and whenever we would approach them about patron needs, you know, the, the response was always, why do they need to do that? Um, why do you need more bandwidth? They shouldn't be going to YouTube. They shouldn't be doing these things. You know, very negative attitude from our IT department about the importance of the public technology access. So we were really wanting some kind of credible capture device or credible evidence that, that backed up what we, what we saw. That yes, you could walk through the public computer aisles and some people are on Facebook and some people are on uh, you know, playing games on Facebook. Um, some people are you know, looking at websites for fun, but a lot of people do a lot of different things every day on your Internet and trying to capture that was was very difficult other than anecdotally. And we all had a few, you know, we have a few success stories. The lady who came in and found a job and you know, or or one of our prize success stories was the lady who used our public computers to get her degree online and then got a job with one of the local businesses. So we always trotted her out as our success story, but other than her, we didn't have a lot of other good data. Once we rolled the impact survey out um, back in 2011, there was a lot of reluctance on people's parts to, um, to answer some of the questions. There was some confusion about what we were asking for, and so we had to clear that up. That we, you know, we're not interested in what you do on your computer at home. We're really interested in what you're doing on the computers when you're in the library, and those are not always the same. We, did, we knew that we had some databases that could only be used in the library. So one of the questions was if they came in to use Ancestry.com, for example, 
are they staying to do other things while they're there, or are they just coming in using Ancestry and then going back home? So the, edge, or, I'm sorry, the, the impact survey gave us a lot of that kind of data. Um, a shocking figure, which I use all the time, was that about 70% of the people in the library using our computer had access to computers in other places, including their home. And so that was a, that's been a key statistic for me to, to ask or, or to put out because as people get more and more devices, the question was, well, isn't the library going to become irrelevant? Or again, why should I increase your bandwidth? They're not going to be using the library. So being able to say that we're not just serving people who don't have access to computers at all, but we're also seeing a lot of people coming in who, who want the value added that the library brings. Then as the EDGE program developed, which we were really happy to be a part of the pilot, but it was a little bit nervous because we weren't sure what all was going to need to be captured. It turned out that the EDGE capture mechanism absolutely dovetailed with the questions on the impact survey. Had we not done the impact survey, it would have been much more difficult to really have the knowledge about what our patrons were doing on the public technology in order to really assess where our strengths were and where we needed to put more resources. And that's really what both of these tools are about is, what are you already doing well? And then what, could you, what, what do you need to do better? And the comparability, because of, you know, most, most governing bodies of libraries, especially public libraries, don't want to put more into the library than they have to because we all have competing interest in the, in the cities or the, the counties or whatever body we're a part of. So they want to do enough, but they don't want to go overboard and put more resources in if it's not necessary. So the comparability to other libraries, both of our size and within our state and then nationally, was really critical when I talked to our shareholders. Um, we just finished our survey. We got 308 responses, which I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but since we were looking at the subset of people who really use the computers in the library, that's actually a pretty decent response, and we're, we're pretty happy with it. Again, we just got a response. Yes, uh, we closed the survey yesterday, so we haven't had time to really analyze what all the information is. But uh, our initial survey, we only had 40 people take the survey. So we already have hundreds more <laughs> than we had before. We, we got people to, you, to take the survey passively, so we did not act actively go up to folks and ask them to take the survey. We had paper copies available, but nobody used them because we really were focusing on people using the technology in the building, and so most of our patrons were comfortable filling out the survey on the public computers or on their own devices if they were using our wireless network. Uh, we used the pop-up box, and we did use the after capture to get people's emails so that we were giving out a $50 Target gift card <laughs> for uh, one lucky person. But interestingly, less than half the people who took the survey actually gave us their email address to be entered into the drawing. We um, also tweeted it. We put emails out. We put it on our Facebook page. We um, had basically links from every place. We used the table tent signs. We used signs in the computer carols. But we didn't actively go up to people and ask them to take the survey. So we feel like the response was pretty good. We did use the press release that was prepared, and that went out into our local newspaper as well as our local radio station. And New Brussels is a city of about 60,000, so if that, that helps to put it in perspective. Um, and we have about 35,000 active card holders. But our public computers, we have 29 public computers. And so the percentage of cardholders are actually using the computers is fairly small. We did again have some confusion about what are you trying to 
capture. And so we had to correct the perception that we didn't really want to know what every resident of our city was doing on their computers at home. We really just wanted to know what they were doing on the computers or the network from the library. And once we cleared that up, um, I think we, that was the main question that we really had. Um, we are looking to repeat our EDGE benchmark assessment in 2014. And so we're going to be very happy to have the impact survey to be able to answer all those questions. But also between now and when we do the EDGE assessment, we've got information about public computer usage because we continually amaze and surprise our city stakeholders about what people are doing on the library computers. Since our participation in 2011, we've gotten um, budget support for a dedicated IT person in the library. We doubled our bandwidth, and we replaced our public computers. And, but most importantly, our IT department now takes us seriously. And I think it's been months since I actually had somebody from the IT department say, why do they need to do that again? So um, I would say that if for no other reason not having to answer why do they need to do that again because of the results of the impact survey was probably the best result of all of them. Yeah, that's great. Gretchen, we got a, had a question. How do you define active cardholders? Um, having used their card within the last three years. Okay, thank you. Gretchen, I really appreciate you um, sharing those stories. And I think you know, a, a couple of things that happened in New Braunfels are, are really reflective of what we're seeing um, across the country. Um, the first thing that you pointed out was that 70% of your folks said that they have access somewhere else. And that um, uh, is the same statistic we had um, for our national survey in, uh, in 2009. And there's a lot of really important reasons why people are still using public access when they have access elsewhere, um, it, uh, but especially because they're getting help from librarians. So it's a really uh, important thing to talk about when you're advocating for your libraries because as Gretchen said, there is a perception that someday magically when everybody has a computer at home, they won't need public access. And our research has shown that that's just not really uh, the case uh, as far as we can predict. In fact, um, just looking at our results, like I said, I just got them. 61% of the people using the computers in the library reported having one-on-one -on -one technology help from a library staff member. And so that's uh, pretty important inf information for me as I lobby to make sure that I keep my staffing levels up, that you know computers are not taking over. And the staff is is an increasingly important component. And then as a director, the other thing that I love is that out of a uh, not how helpful was library technology, staff help, it was the choices were not too helpful, somewhat helpful, and very helpful. And we got a 94.9 very helpful and 3.4% uh, uh, somewhat helpful and only 0.8% not too helpful. That one, that one grumpy person. <laughs> <laughs> that one, or they didn't know. You know, I mean, sometimes people come in with some pretty esoteric questions about software, where uh, you know the percentage of the population who wouldn't even know what it was is pretty small. So we can't be everything to everybody. But um, when I look at the, that user satisfaction statistic that says that, okay, I've got 3.4 percent to go, but um, <laughs> The work that we've put into raising staff awareness of the importance, and that's something I really didn't touch on, but um, we have a facility where we have paraprofessionals on the desks as well as professionals, and everybody's expected to answer a basic level of questions. And convincing the staff that this is a critical skill that they need to learn, that they need to put time into to obtain, and that um, what the public is doing also is not, again, frivolous or just because they play a game on Facebook doesn't mean that's all they did on the computers that day. 
So sometimes convincing your own staff of the, the value of what the service they provide is the first step and sometimes the more difficult step. Good point. Yeah, we've heard that um, we've heard that quite a bit too. That the the results of the survey really do have an impact on library staff, um, and also on on IT departments who, as you experience, often um, don't really understand um, how how important public access is or um, what kinds of things people are doing um, on the computer. So it's great to hear that confirmed as well. Sam, could I ask a couple of questions before we move on to the edge and? Just clarification questions about impact survey? Sure. Okay. We're getting some time frame questions. Um, so the survey is open now, correct? Yes. And it, yes. it just opened a month ago, is that right? Right, yes. And, and we are in beta mode, which just means, you know, forgive us if something goes wrong, we'll fix it as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. And so that was a new version of the survey, so it has just been updated, is that right? That's right, yeah. We okay. did do some revisions to the survey instrument to reflect some of the um, um, suggestions that libraries made to us. Okay. And then what's the time frame for, so if someone's ready to start now, they can do that, but if someone isn't ready until, say, next April, is that too late to start? No, no. You can take this. You can use the survey at any time. Um, it's totally up to you. I know. You know. A lot of times you have other surveys that you feel during the year, or you have certain times of the year that you would prefer. So you're able to set those serving period, uh, survey pe fielding periods any time that you want, uh, and and run it at your convenience. Okay. And one last question for you, Sam. Um, can you add custom questions to the survey? No. Um, we don't have that ability. Um, one of the, the upsides of Impact Survey is that we have a very, very large data set, or we will have a very large data set um, with uh, all the same data from many different libraries. So that helps us a lot to be able to present national findings. Um, but also we, we've, we've gone through a lot of trouble to um, develop the questions and make sure that they're valid. So um, for right now, uh, we don't have that capability. We will be adding in the future, however, some additional types of surveys. So this one is focused on public access. We intend to, um, to develop one that focuses on readership and, and devices that follows along with the recent Pew studies. And as libraries make suggestions for other kinds of surveys they'd like to see, we'll add those too, but always being careful that we validate the survey questions. Okay. And then this is sort of for Gretchen and both of you, I think, just to clarify. So Gretchen said she focused on in-library use, that subset, people who were using computers in the library. So that's just a, a choice that was made um, for new brown files, but overall that's not the focus of the survey, correct? The, the focus of the outcomes portion of the survey is on people who are using public access technology, either the computers or the Wi-Fi. So that's the kind of the biggest portion of it. But before they get to that point, there's a number of questions that also pertain to use of um, electronic resources like e-books and, and audio books that they download and, and databases that they access through the website. So it's, it's geared towards both. It makes sense for people who are coming into it from home through the library website Site. And if they say they've never used a public access computer or the library's wireless, they don't have to answer any of those um, additional outcome questions. Okay. If you're a library with multiple locations, can you collate report responses by location? So in all of the reports, the, the results are in the aggregate. So those, those pre-formatted reports um, show um, your aggregate responses. Um, the report that shows the comments, so we have two open-ended questions in the survey, one that uh, allows people to say other ways that they use public access and the other that um, provides them with the opportunity to make suggestions. Um, the report that contains those comments is broken down um, by branch. If you're interested in how the results are um, by branch, you can download that CSV file and do that analysis um, yourself. So each, uh, each individual survey response is marked um, with the branch that it came from if they selected a branch. So you'll be able to do that. Great, thank you. So we've got about five minutes left, and I know you wanted to talk about EDGE too. So. 
Yeah, I'm just going to uh, kind of skip forward and just briefly touch on how these two work together. Gretchen talked about it um, somehow. She used it, but but Edge and, and Impact Survey, uh, Impact Survey, and, and my research group have been very much involved in the Edge initiative since its very beginning. So um, we've really worked to make these two um, initiatives work together. So the Impact Survey. Uh, it provides some resources that you can use in, in your advocacy efforts and, and needs assessment for EDGE. Um, and it also pr uh, actually um, um, uh, gives you the criteria to answer yes to some of the assessment questions. So if, uh, if you're familiar with EDGE and, or, or you're going into taking um, EDGE in January, there will be an online assessment um, that will ask questions about the library. And there are several um, questions that um, if you have used the impact survey, you can answer yes. So there's questions about whether you surveyed your patrons, and so you can answer yes to those. Um, that uh, the, collectively that is about 50 points on the assessment, but it also provides you with materials that you can use um, to support other activities um, that are um, recommended by, by, by the EDGE benchmarks. So uh, with just uh, a couple of minutes left, I, I, I wanted to give a chance to answer any outstanding questions and um, get any feedback that you have. Good. So uh, we have a few, and then again, please feel free to keep sharing if you if you have more questions. One was you mentioned earlier that there are test accounts so that people could look at just what a survey looks like. How would they get access to those test accounts? Um, well, if they just want to look at the survey instrument it's itself, know what the questions are in the survey, um, that's available uh, on a link, uh, with a link on our website on impactsurvey.org. So uh, you can look at the survey questions in paper form. Uh, test accounts we're giving mostly to um, library um, uh, uh, consortium or co-ops or kind of umbrella organizations that work with many libraries that might want to coordinate their work. Uh, there's nothing in those test accounts that is different than uh, an account uh, that a library would have if they set, uh, signed up. Okay. Good. And Gretchen, this one's for you. You said that because of the data you were able to show to the City IT that you were able to get your bandwidth increased. What was you increased from what to what? Someone would like to know. Oh, our bandwidth went from 10 megabytes to 20 megabytes, and we're getting ready to make the argument to to double it again. Um, but 10 megabytes. One of the arguments was the whole city was only running on 10 megabytes. So why would the public need so much bandwidth? And we, we just were able to show what the public was doing and all the different needs they had, and that helped them to then go ahead and, and agree to make the public bandwidth bigger than the cities. The city is now 20 megabits also, but um, it, that was part of the, the problem with them. Good. Thank you. And Sam, this one's for you. This is someone who's been using the – I'm going to put this in chat again, so if you want to glance down there. Someone who had taken or had done the previous impact survey, and here's a question about the data and what they're extrapolating from the results. So I'll let you take a look at that. I just put it in chat. Uh, so um, if 34% say they use computers for job finding, um, is that a legitimate de deduction? So um, I think uh, there's a couple of ways that you can approach deducing um, uh, information about your community as a whole from the results of the survey. Um, one of those ways is to look at the demographics of the respondents in certain categories and then look at the population of those um, folks uh, overall in your community. So if, for example, you're seeing that on the survey that 40% of the people who are using um, public access for health purposes are over the age of 65. 
Um, and then you see in your particular community that your population over the age of 65 is, is 20 percent, then you can use that to kind of extrapolate up to your population. This is just kind of back of the envelope quick figuring. This is obviously not scientific. But one of my favorite evaluators, Harry Hatchery from the Urban Institute says, it's better to be roughly right than precisely ignorant. And so you can use this information to think about, oh gee, if we have this large population of older folks and older folks are using the computers for health, maybe we should have a program for older folks and health use of computers or something like that. And a question about the survey results, and are they available to organizations other than libraries? And I'm not sure if that means in a particular community or the overall re results. Um, so the results of the survey are available to the library that fielded it and is also available to your state library. So we have a portal for state libraries where they can go in um, and retrieve aggregate reports of all the libraries that have run the survey in their state and also um, see what the results are for individual libraries. And we've given that uh, capability to them because um, they're oftentimes or usually such a critical um, uh, uh, advocate for public access in the state that it's important for them to have that information also. And how about is ag okay aggregated on a national level? Is that sort of data going to be made available? This the, um, we have someone who advocates for libraries to get more broadband and is wondering if the results of the survey are would be available to her. Um, so uh, we will be releasing reports about the results at the end of the year. So once we've collected a year's worth of data through um, libraries that are using Impact Survey, we will issue a report. Um, we're going through a process of trying to figure out how to make the data set itself available for other people to use. Um, we're designing an interface right now where people can play with that data on their own. Um, but uh, we're not sure right now about how to release the data in a way that protects the library um, from release of, of information that they may not want um, and also respects um, you know, the, the patron's privacy as well. Okay, and then one last question before we um, sign off is how is the survey kept current? So we are uh, constantly looking at the survey um, to make sure that it has relevant questions. So every year we're going through looking at the survey, removing questions that we found had um, poor response rates overall, um, adding questions um, on subjects that libraries have uh, expressed interest in having. So um, we, uh, we're always happy to hear from libraries and suggestions, um, and we keep track of those. And then when we do our um, our revision cycle, we'll look through that. Okay, good. Well, we have reached the end of our session, and I know people have, have things to do. I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been really informative. We're getting good feedback in the chat. So thank you both to Sam and to Gretchen for taking the time to talk about these things with us today. Just as a reminder, later today we're going to send up a fo follow-up email and it will have a link to different sites that we've talked about. It will have the PowerPoint slides and it will have um, this recording too. And we encourage you to share this with other people if, if it would be useful to them. So again, thank you Sam and thank you Gretchen. Thank you. Thanks to TechSoup for doing this. This was great. Yes. Thank you to, to both of you, and I encourage libraries to sign up now. <laughs> Great. So as we close, you'll get an evaluation form, so feel free to weigh in on that and let us know what was useful to you and what suggestions you have for future sessions. Thanks everyone, and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>